Hello again and welcome back to Illegally Cited. This is Jesse aka BGFH and I'm back for kind of a very quick channel update video but more importantly I wanted to talk about a subject that has been going crazy apparently on the Twitterverse and online and in videos and podcasts and such and um, I've been busy at my day job you know throughout the week so I really haven't had a whole lot of time to devote to it but I've seen this topic just exploding everywhere on my YouTube feed and social media and whatever. So the main topic for today is kind of a combination of accessibility and difficulty or, you know, accessibility versus difficulty or, you know, in combination uh, thereof. And, you know, it's something that I've talked about in some degree um, before on the, you know, on the channel. Um, but this really got started because there's, there was a conversation going on about, well, should this, uh, the latest from software game Sekiro, uh, which is this, you know, third person very noted to be very difficult series of action games, action RPGs. And, um, you know, people are saying, well, should there be an easy, difficult, easier difficulty so people can play it people, it can be more accessible. And some people just got super angry about it and defensive and like, but they intended this game to be the way it is. And if you do that, you're going to sacrifice. Then it's not, then it's not this game anymore because it's meant to be hard and it's meant to, you're, you're meant to feel this sense of accomplishment and blah, 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 whatever. And to a degree, I sort of get where they're coming from. You know, you're trying to make something where, yeah, you really want to, um, you know, you really, you, you really want to accomplish, feel like you accomplish something after you've made it through this crazy area and beat these bosses and whatever. Um, you know, but then I've heard the accessibility point of it as well, which, you know, I'm kind of in the middle for, like, I, I don't want them to compromise the integrity of what the vision that they were going for. But at the same time, I definitely want it to be accessible to a degree where as many people as possible can play it, you know? Um, you know, I saw, uh, Steve Saylor's video, uh, the other day, and, uh, he's the guy that I was on the panel, uh, panel with at GA Conf a couple weeks ago, you know, and his thing, you know, his thing is, is that he made a lot of good points in his video, uh, you know, but where this sense of, you know, this difficulty, this sense of, uh, challenge or, you know, un unintended or unintended or not, is something that people with disabilities have to face no matter what game they're playing because they, we always have to wonder. You know, if you're blind or if you're low vision or if you have another physical disability, um, you know, before you even buy a game, you have to evaluate, is this something I can even play? You know, there are a lot of games that I choose not to play even though I think they would be cool, um, but because there are because they're very, very small text heavy and there's a lot of small text or there are just a lot of things that blend into each other, <coughs> you know, any number of visual things that can make it very difficult, if not impossible. Uh, and, you know, kind of can make things tedious and frustrating at best and unplayable at worst. So I definitely see where he's coming from and I largely agree with that point. Um, but at the same time, you know, adding uh, different difficulties or options, I wouldn't even go as far as to say difficulty. Because difficulty settings are a part of it, but I think that's just one aspect. There are other ways to control difficulty than just a difficulty setting. You don't just have to rely on easy, normal, and hard, or whatever you choose to call them. Um, because we, you know, we, like I said, as somebody with a disability, I want to be challenged too. You know, I want to, uh, if I'm playing doom or if I'm playing a first person shooter or an action game or a racing game. Yeah. I want to, you know, feel the thrill of just, you know, barely surviving the battle, but win but actually winning or, being in this tight car race and I've just before the finish line, I managed to eke out first place. You know, that's yeah, that's an awesome feeling. It's great. You know, but I mean, if, if there are some gameplay assists like auto aim or like an acceleration assist or brake assist in a racing game, 
you don't have to use those things. Um, you know, they don't, you know, you can play the game <clears throat> with whatever options you choose because technically any option really is a form of accessibility, whether you think it is or not, really. Um, you know, if you feel it's uncomfortable to play a first-person shooter with the mouse sensitivity really, really low because it takes you forever to turn around, uh, or you, uh, you want the, the controls to be inverted or not inverted, that's a choice, you know? I mean, otherwise it just, it doesn't work for you. It doesn't, it's not comfortable for you. It's not natural for you. Um, those are things that are in pretty much any any third person first person game and those could be a, you know considered like an accessibility preference um you know we're not just in i think the thing is is once things get labeled as accessibility you know people lump the things in just with disability and they think you know again whether it's a game or a web page or software or an app whatever you know, people generally tend to think that, well, if I include accessibility, I'm going to have to compromise my original vision for this product because I'm, I'm, it's going to have to be simple because people with disabilities are simpletons and they can't do what we can, so I have to compromise my original vision. And, and that is absolutely not the truth. I've seen many apps, I've played many games that are very accessible and that are fantastic as far as, you know, as far as low vision goes, they're great. They're visually stimulating. They're exciting to play, um, but they're usable either by a low vision user or somebody with uh, a screen reader or voiceover. I mean, pff, Skullgirls, that's a full fighting game. The 2D art is great. Um, it looks, you know, they didn't compromise anything at all. Um a lot of the voiceover games, you know, some of the ones that actually use, you know, that aren't necessarily designed specifically for blind people, uh, but the ones that, you know, just happen to include that level of accessibility but make it playable for everybody, that's something that everybody can enjoy. So it's not, you know, they don't have to compromise the visual look of it necessarily just to make it uh, work for everybody. And on top of that, what is helpful for somebody with a disability <clears throat> is also helpful oftentimes for everybody else, you know? Um, let's say, let's take difficulty settings, since that's what we're talking about. If, you know, if you have a disability and maybe you need more reaction time or you need, you know, uh, some kind of assist or you need whatever it is, um, that can be an accessibility tool for you. But then let's say... You, you know, you're just, uh, um, you know, you're, you're a f fully able-bodied uh, gamer or whatever you want to call it, and you get home from work, you're tired from a long day. You don't necessarily want to, you don't always want to, you know, have a challenging game. Maybe you're just in the mood for a good, explore, you know, explore a new uh, uh, fictional world. Maybe you want to, you know, participate in a really cool story but you don't want to have to die 30 times getting past uh, this boss or this group of enemies. So, you know, that's something that can be, oh, okay, you can, um, you know, be more story-oriented. And that lower difficulty setting also uh, helps those people. Um, all those types of things. So, you know, I... I there's like I said, there's no right. The, the thing is, there's no right answer because it's just a matter of perspective, how you look at this difficulty thing. Um, you know, I've got a couple things written down just on all of the videos and tweets that I saw in the last couple of days, even though I missed a great majority of them. But even in the barrage that I saw, uh, you know, the first thing I talked about was the creative intent versus accessibility you know you don't have to limit creative uh your creative vision just to <clears throat> add a level of accessibility to your game um passive versus interactive uh this tie is kind of, it kind of ties into the whole um it kind of ties into the 
create creative vision versus accessibility because you know if you're reading a book watching a movie or a tv show uh you're listening to music those are passive media they're basically they're going to be the same they're going to be exactly the same the first time and the 20th time you watch or read or listen to them so in that case you know yeah the director the uh the writer the uh, musician, they all have, you know, basically their artistic intent is you get what it is because it was recorded or written down and that's what you get. And it's going to be the same every time. And games, you have that interactive component. So no matter how a game is developed, you know, you could have it designed super well. It could be, you know, perfectly designed and everything with their the artist's perfect vision um, you know, but you can't account for, you know, everyone's ability is different. Everyone's intent is different. You know, you have people who, um, I forget, there was this study or this write-up a while back where they basically tried to classify gamers into a few groups. Um, I think there were four key groups. There was like uh, the explorer, the social person, the killer, the and I don't remember what the fourth one was, but you know, you have different intents for what the gamer wants to do. You know, you get some players who just like to, let's say you will take Skyrim, for example. Um, you know, some people just want to look around this ginormous open world and just soak it in, uh, make up their own kind of story, adventure as they go along and just explore and yeah, soak it in at their own pace. Then you have the killers and, you know, who are just really driven toward like, yeah, I want to, I want action and I want to complete quests and I want to just, you know, min max this thing. I want to, you know, wring everything I can out of it, you know, and kind of get the best like performance out of myself and out of the game as I can, you know, and then you have the social people you get, you know, people who play MMOs a lot or multiplayer a lot, you know, sometimes, yeah, they might be doing it because they like the multiplayer, but Sometimes it's just a fun, interactive way. Instead of just sitting there talking on the phone uh, after work or after school, they just want to, you know, maybe play a multiplayer shooter or a racing game or a MMO. And they want to socialize. And it just so happens we can, uh, you know, kill some orcs or race some cars or something to do it. Um, you know, and then even if any, everybody has essentially the same experience, uh, you know, take The Division 2 or take... Um, Sekiro, um, you know, everyone is going to go about it differently, you know, so even though the game, you know, is largely the same, you can't control what the player is going to do. So it's not like this passive medium. And based on the person's abilities, you know, be it even if they don't have a disability whatsoever, some people are new to games, some people can't wrap their head around the complexities of a modern controller. Maybe they played video games in like the Atari days or the NES days, but you know, they just can't, they don't really, you know, they don't really have the interest or, uh, you know, they, they just can't handle the modern controls as much. Um, and then you have the accessibility stuff on top of that. Um, you know, and an example of that is the, you know, single, you know, the other thing is anything can pretty much be an accessibility feature. You know, there's this kind there's kind of this debate whether, <clears throat> and this is kind of its own topic in a way, but I'm going to roughly touch on it here because it does apply to difficulty, uh, difficulty and accessibility. Um, you know, you have, um, everything can be considered, every option that a game gives you, not just uh, difficulty settings, but something as common as like a uh, mouse sensitivity in an action game or a first-person shooter, uh, the option to play with the mouse inverted. Um, those are two common things that are pretty much in every third- or first-person action game or shooter. Um, those are, I would consider a lot of those kind of accessibility features because for me on a, on a regular, I can play inverted with a flying game because that's what it's kind of meant to be. But I 
cannot play a regular first person or third person shooter with inverted controls. It just doesn't feel right. It's uncomfortable. It just, it feels awkward. It's just, no, it's not it. No, you people are weird. <laughs> you know, these, the inverted, you know, it's like looking down and rolling your eyes back up in your head. That's what it seems like to me. But the people, I'm not knocking the people who play that way. Um, you know, if you, if that's what you do, that's your accessibility thing. That's what you're used to. That's what you're comfortable with. Same thing with, you know, everyone has their own mouse sensitivity. Maybe some people play with their, you know, they move the mouse really fast and they do it that way. And some people are, have to move it slower, um, for whatever reason, that's an accessibility feature and that's everywhere. No one comments on those unless God forbid they're missing. Um, so, you know, you could even say like whether a game is playable, um, online versus offline, you know, you take something like left for dead, um, or the division two. So there's also been some talk recently about the division two being really difficult, not just for accessibility, but you know, mainstream gamer gaming media and game, uh, gamers in general, I've seen posts of, or people will say things like, yeah, this game is definitely meant to be played online in a group. Uh, because soloing the missions, you know, the guy, the, the, your enemies are just super accurate and aggressive and <coughs> it's just really hard to play solo. And that ties into accessibility because, uh, let's say in the division, um, one of the reasons I don't play a lot of multiplayer games, especially, eh, you know, cooperative or I don't play with a lot of random people, put it that way. Unless it's a, maybe like a straight-up death match or something where it doesn't really matter. But a lot of today's games, you know, you're in a group. You're meant to be contributing, you know, uh, whether it's a team death match or a team objective-based game or a cooperative game. Um, you know, I don't play online that much because I don't want to feel... Like, I feel like my skill level is lower than a lot of your sighted gamer gamers out there. And if I were to play with a bunch of randos, random people, you know, I would feel like I'm dragging them down because what takes them, you know, five seconds to read something might take me a little bit longer or, Oh, I didn't see that enemy off in the distance to cover you because you know, it blended in, or there was something that were, it was harder for me to see it, or I didn't notice that you were down in the other side of the room because I can't watch the main game and see the little mini-map indicator. Uh, I can't monitor that in the corner at the same time. So it's things like that where, like, one of the, one or two, one of the, one of two things is going to happen. Either they're going to you know, just they'll they'll basically be playing the game, and I'll just be kind of along for the ride, maybe getting a few kills in here, or if, you know, contributing ever every every so often, or they are just going to basically, you know, because we all know how uh, we all know how uh, kind and considerate uh, a lot of the game community is, where you know you get a, <laughs> these multiplayer games, and there's just this this toxic. Um, you know, toxic chatter. I mean, most people disable voice chat these days just because of that reason, whether you're disabled or not. But, um, <clears throat> you know, that's the other thing that'll happen is like, oh, well, you, stu you suck, or you, you know, you noob, or you, you know, and then they find, if they find out you're disabled, well, what the hell is a blind person playing this game for? Get out of here, you know? I mean, I can just kind of hear it. So it's like, either I feel like I'm not pulling my weight, or even if I sort of am, it still may not be enough for them. And then, like I said, you're just going to get that, that hostility. Um, so I, you know, I would love to play the division too, and maybe they'll patch it in later. Um, but I, I do hope that maybe they make some of the, the soloing, especially at least for the, the main campaign or the main kind of a story, uh, up until the part where you, you know, pretty much have to play your raids and stuff like that. I hope that they do kind of iron that out a little bit and make it a little bit more soloable. Same thing with Left 4 Dead. I brought up Left 4 Dead 1 and 2. And that is another game where 
I generally play it when I did the playthroughs on my channel. I played them with AI bots for that very reason. I'm not playing with random people where I'm accidentally not doing well and they're pulling me through the game or, you know, I'm getting that, you know, I'm getting that hostility. Um, and I didn't have enough friends to play a four player game uh, to, to do the whole thing. So I said, yeah, let's play with the bots and go forward. I've done that with a few of uh, these different co-op games. Uh, what was it, Earthfall last year that came out that kind of had a similar type of spiel? Oh, or um, Vermintide, Vermintide 2. I love those games, but I largely played them with the AI. So that's kind of why I do that. And so ha just having that ability, having those bots or having you know, that difficulty in game for a division to play solo is an accessibility. It's kind of, it's kind of its own difficulty setting to say that, Hey, if I don't want to play online, if I want to maybe enjoy the environment or go at my own speed, because I maybe don't, you know, I can't play quite as quickly as the, everybody else. Um, that's kind of an accessibility mode or accessibility feature there because anyone can play how they want to and not ruin somebody else's experience. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of a different type of difficulty or accessibility feature. It can, it's kind of both. Uh, I just want to look at something here. Yeah. So having, um, this is kind of a different topic in its own, but you know, some people in, you know, there's the b debate, do you want to have accessibility features in its own sort of menu, or do you just want them integrated into the overall options menu again? Because then you have this stigma if you say, on one hand, I see both sides. Because on one hand, it's really nice to have an accessibility menu to have like the things that one would normally consider like an accessibility thing, like, you know, oh, a large font or a colorblind mode or, um, a, you know, text to speech. Yeah, those things most of us would probably associate with some with some type of accessibility feature. And you could say, okay, key mappings are like that too, but a lot of games have key maps and key mappings and those are just under controls. Those are just under control settings. So should you know um, should we have our own accessibility menu just to make those types of things there? Or because what I said earlier, everything is already its, its own accessibility thing to a degree. So every option is basically its own accessibility feature or accessibility to a degree. So maybe text-to-speech, uh, would that be under uh, like audio settings? Or would font size and contrast, would that, would that option go under d uh, display or visuals? Um, you know, you would have things maybe for either press and hold instead of rapidly hitting a button for quick time events or the option to skip quick time events altogether. Should that just be under controls or should these things be kind of broken out into their own accessibility menu? That's kind of a separate topic, but I think it still kind of ties in because to make a game playable by the widest, uh, the widest, number of people, um, you're not just looking at accessibility, you're not just looking at difficulty, but you're kind of finding some happy medium. Um, because, you know, again, if you're adding those features, and let's say it's supposed to be a hard game like Sekiro is, or any number of other games, uh, I played Ninja Gaiden, Ninja Gaiden and Ninja Gaiden Black on the original Xbox, and those games were really freaking hard. But I stuck with them. And there were a couple things that were visually a little bit harder. But I got the same sense of accomplishment. I beat that game without any assistance from anybody. And I might have had to grind a little bit more because I, I would probably, I would grind for a few more orbs so I could buy maybe a few more potions or a few more resurrection items because there would be just certain things that I would have trouble with and I needed that extra bit of, uh, a bit, a bit of assistance. But the game gave me that ability and so I did it and I beat it and I, f I that game was really really hard and I felt pretty damn proud when I beat it cuz it's like every I know a lot of people who just couldn't get past the first or second level you know and I beat the whole thing
So, you know, just having <clears throat> not just difficulty, but any sort of option, customization. But when you do get into difficulty settings, I like what a few recent games have been doing. Things like Celeste, um, where you don't necessarily have difficulty settings, but you can customize, like, how do you want the game to play? Do you, do you, you know, you'll have the same challenge, but do you just need things to slow down a little bit? Or do you need, um, God, I'm trying to remember even all the options that they had. Um, but, you know, they had a lot of different options to basically, you could still go through the challenge just like everybody else, um, but you could still kind of adjust it to whatever you were physically able to do or whatever you were just mentally wanting to accomplish. You know, if you had no physical disability and you just wanted to, to ease your time and to just have fun breezing through the environments, that's okay too. Or something like Shadow of the Tomb Raider. This I thought was really cool because you didn't just have, again, easy, normal, and hard. You actually could say, okay, well, I'm not very good at action, but I love puzzles. So let me make the action a little bit easier, but I want to make the puzzles, or I want to have them actually to be normal or harder difficulty, or vice versa. I want to play this like an action game, and I don't want puzzles getting in the way. So you can turn the difficulty of that down, and you can make the, uh, the, action, um, the action harder. Or the exploration. You actually had action, you had like, uh, was it action, exploration, and, or combat, expo exploration, and puzzles. Um, and that's a really cool thing. And then you had things like Mass Effect, the Mass Effect series where they would ask you, you know, and they didn't demean you for, for doing it. You know, it's like, you know, people say, oh, you got to play on this difficulty because that's the way it was meant to be played and you're a scrub if you don't. No. Um, Mass Effect, great series. Eh, maybe the last one, not so much, but the first, the trilogy was great. Um, but, you know, they would say, they would ask you, do you want, do you want a challenging... Uh, combat experience? Do you want to do you want to experience a great science fiction story? Um, you know, do you really want to dig into the RP, RPG mechanics? I forget exactly what the options were, but you had like two or three different options as far as how you wanted to experience the game, and it wasn't necessarily framed in a difficulty uh, thing. It didn't make you say like if you wanted to experience a good story. You know, it didn't make you feel bad uh, for, you know, choosing that option, which would make some of the combat instances easier. So I like that, that games are actually going in that route to give you that kind of a customization to say, it's not just a, you know, it's not just a difficulty setting. It's a choose the way you kind of want to play game. You know, do you want to look at the environment? Do you want a story? Do you want a challenge? Or do you want a combination of those? So, you know, that's just um, some of my thoughts um, on the whole accessibility and difficulty debate that seems to be going on. Because there seems to be a few different arguments. And, you know, of course, not every game is going to be for everybody. Uh, you know, I mean, a good example of that is... There are a few iOS games that I've covered on the channel or that I'm going to cover on the channel that I know are solid games. I know that a lot of people are going to like them, but despite them being accessible to me um, and they work with voiceover, I'm just not really into that type of game. You know, uh, pure text-based looking at numbers and stats and things that, you know, I can do it for a little while, but that's just generally not my thing. And that's not a bad thing, um, but that you know that has nothing to do with accessibility. Um, but uh, you know we can get the same challenges. Uh, everybody still gets the same challenges. It's just maybe it's for them, maybe it isn't. Sekiro or other difficult game. You know we want the challenge, we want the feeling of accomplishment, but just you know giving people a way to. Um, access that 
if they choose to. Um, there's nothing that says if you want, you know, if you don't want any of those assists, if you don't want to lower a difficulty setting, or if you don't want to use certain options, you don't have to. Um, you know, it's not going to take away from your experience, but it will open up, um, open it up to a lot, a lot more people if it were included. So I hope, I know that's a lot of babble. Um, I probably didn't do the most eloquent job at describing all of that, but those are kind of my thoughts. Um, you know, obviously I'm highly in favor of accessibility settings or accessibility features. Um, <laughs> I went to a whole conference on it and I've been advocating for it for uh, quite a while. Um, but I get the artistic side and stuff too. And we just, be, the bottom line is people just want to play games. People want to have fun. People want to have, you know, they're games. You know, let's play them. Let's have fun. Um, and I, if I remember, if I remember, I will try to put a link in uh, Danny O'Dwyer from Noclip did a really nice summary, I think, of how all these different perspectives intersect as well. Um, and I'll try to remember to put a link to that video in uh, the description below as well, because I think he did a really good job of probably doing it better than I did. But, they, but you know, really giving a, I don't want to say factual, but more of like a clear breakdown of all these different angles that are coming into this game's difficulty and accessibility topic um, but these are just my thoughts, um, you know, take them or leave them, but there they are. I just figured since I'm really focusing on accessibility and this has been a really hot topic, uh, of late, I could probably chime in with a few thoughts of my own. So to wrap up the video, um, just really quickly, um, you know, channel update, pretty cool, pretty cool. Um... We broke 1,500 subscribers, and we are actually a bit past that, uh, 1514, I believe it is. And um, so, yeah, thanks to everybody who is who has subscribed recently or has discovered the channel recently. Uh, again, everything is divided up into playlists. Um, I do have a lot of content uh, coming out. I have a couple, of, at least one or two ideas for some access unlocked videos, basically taking a game concept or gameplay type and trying to figure out how to make it more accessible to a blind or low vision audience. Uh, there's one or two that I definitely want to do for that in the near future. A lot of games coming out this year. Um, a lot of games coming out in the next month that I'm really in, month or so that I'm interested in. We got MK11. We have Dangerous Driving, which really seems to be a it seems to be a good uh, Burnout Three spiritual successor. So I'm all about that. That's next week. Um, jo uh, Vacation Simulator, I believe, is in the next week too. Woohoo! Yeah, we get to do more uh, cool robot simulation there. Um, we got that. We got Rage Two coming out in about a month and a half. Month, month and a half. So. Uh, and then more after that. So who knows? But there's a lot of stuff coming. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing the mixer thing, hopefully. And um, hopefully I will get around to Sekiro. I'm still uh, working on this Rico game that has just surprised the heck out of me. And I've kind of been hooked on it, despite it. You know, it's not the most high-fidelity game. It's kind of jank. It's kind of goofy. But I kind of like it. So um, there is that. Um, what else? There's something to see. Did I write anything else down? I just want to look at my notes that I kind of wrote down. Things that I wanted to chat about. Um. Oh, right, right. Um, <laughs> I did briefly want to mention, um, you know, definitely, if you have questions, um, if you have questions or comments, you know, leave them in the comments down below. I do read them. I try to reply uh, to reply to them if I can or if I have something helpful that I can contribute. 
Um, if you do have accessible game suggestions, uh, especially on the PC side where, like I said, I just may not find all of them. I'm pretty good about usually getting most of the uh, iOS ones because I do follow Apple Viz pretty closely. Um, but just because there are so many avenues for finding out about uh, audio games or accessible games on the PC. But, you know, either way, if you uh, have some accessible games that uh, are new that you've heard of, you might want me to check out. I will uh, do my best and see what I can do. Um, but please don't spam. <laughs> I've had a couple, I've had a couple of comments where like every video somebody is posting like, can you cover this one game? Can you cover this one game? Can you cover this or the same game? I'm like, dude, okay. Um, I, I will try to at some point. Um, but as I've said in other videos too, I'm not necessarily going to cover every single blindfold game because there's like 80 of them. And what, you know, really once you play a few of them, you kind of know what to expect. You know, you've got some word games, you got some, you got some card games, you've got a, uh, you know, a couple little arcadey type games. But you know, the overall interface is largely the same. You know, for getting started, you have the coin system, you have a free play, you have coins, you have add-on packs, perhaps. But you know, I mean, if there's some like really unique kind of a thing that catches my attention, sure, I'll cover it. But I'm not going to cover every blindfold game. You know, I mean, sh great that they keep coming out, but I'm not necessarily going to cover all of them. So just, you know, please don't spam. You know, you can suggest, but please don't spam uh, with the same game suggestions over and over. So, um, but yeah, that said, um, if you are a game developer or if you are, um, if you are in charge of making a podcast, if you're a podcaster, uh, if you are writing an article in, you know, the games or technology press, it's not just games, but uh, technology accessibility, um, assistive technology, gaming, VR, any of those types of things. Uh, I am available. Like I said, you can contact me through the YouTube comments. You can follow me on Twitter at BGFH7, excuse me, at BGFH79. Um... You can reach me all kinds of different ways. Um, you know, DM me, uh, send a message down below. Um, I will absolutely um, get back to you. Uh, if you're interested in uh, me guesting on a podcast or you want, you know, I have some questions about uh, an app or a game or something you're trying to make accessible, uh, let me know that we are out here and uh, we'll try to help out how we can. That being said, I think we'll wrap it up here. Hope you found the video interesting. Hope you enjoyed it. As I said, you can follow me on Twitter at BGFH79, Mixer.com slash BGFH. And you can also go to IllegallyCited.com for all of my other stuff. So until next time, I will chat with you guys in the next video.